seminar and it worked very well. You don't, if you have any questions to ask during the talk or after the talk, please do so. You are free to do so. But what I suggest is sometimes questions may come to you later or your English may be good enough to listen but may not be good enough to have the confidence to ask questions. In which case, what I suggest is, you send me written questions. If you send me written questions, tonight or tomorrow morning, then I can base tomorrow's talk on those questions. You are free to be as impertinent as you like. <laughs> you are Free to be as offensive as you would like. No problem. Please ask him to give me the questions I pass them on to you. That people give me the questions. Ah, the questions are to be handed over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Kinda said, please hand over the questions to him and he will hand them over to me. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to do is remove some misconceptions. The biggest misconception that I found about what you are seeking and what is to be sought and what do you expect to get out of the teaching and when the understanding happens. In other words, the biggest misconception is that of a sage. A sage being someone who is supposed to have had the full, total, unconditional, deepest understanding. The misconception is this. The misconception is that people expect the sage to be a perfect human being. That is wrong, absolutely wrong. The sage cannot be a perfect human being. His height is not going to go up by 12 inches. His weight is not going to be increased or reduced by 50 pounds. His temperament is not going to change magnanimously. So it's a tremendous misconception to expect that a sage is a perfect human being. In other words, what I'm saying is the sage will have the same weaknesses which the body-mind organism had before the understanding happened. The sage will have the same weaknesses. You see, the the, the one who made the biggest impression in India in recent years is Ramana Maharshi. So they saw Ramana Maharshi or read about him and heard 
that he rarely got angry. He rarely expressed any desire to for anything. He was calm and contented, rarely got excited. So that was the picture which has remained in the minds of people about a sage. That, but the point I'm making is that Ramana Maharshi had that kind of a temperament even before the understanding happened at the early age of 16 or something like that. In other words, Ramana Maharshi was never a seeker. He was never a seeker. He didn't seek any guru. He didn't do any spiritual practice, whatever. It just happened. In other words, what I'm trying to impress on you is the fact that it was not the final full self-realization which gave Ramana Maharshi the temperament that people saw. He was exactly as before. And the interesting thing is that the teaching does not need you to change anyway. Because the change that you will try to bring about will still be made by the same ego doer. And the basis of what I have to say is, according to my concept, the basis of self-realization or enlightenment or whatever is merely the total, unconditional, deepest acceptance that there is no doer, either as you or anyone else. That is all, to me, self-realization means. That there is no individual doer. The Buddha had put it beautifully. He said, events happen. Deeds are done. There is no individual doer thereof. Can anything be simpler than that? I honestly would like to know. And such an enormous mystery is made out of seeking enlightenment. And because there is such a mystery made, you have so many gurus. As a friend of mine said, these days, anyone who has flown over Lucknow in India <laughs> starts as a guru. <laughs> Is that right, Wayne? Anybody who knows anyone. <laughs> <laughs> that is because such a mystery is made of it. And two, the impression is given that it is up to you to achieve enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And my whole point is, there is no one, no ego seeker to achieve enlightenment. Enlightenment can only happen. That's the most important thing I would like to impress again and again. The second thing is, you will hear me say repeat, repeatedly, my concept is this, that is my concept. I keep repeating that whatever I say is a concept. I say this because I know with confidence that the teaching will be acceptable to the intellect. Because it is logical. And a great peace comes out of it. But the intellect will repeatedly ask, I like it. It is logical. I cannot find a flaw in it. But how do I know it is the truth? 
repeatedly that question will arise. Therefore, I'm making it perfectly clear that whatever any sage has said at any time, whatever any scripture of any religion has said at any time, is a concept. A concept being something which some people may accept, some people will not be able to accept. Therefore, any teaching by any say is a concept. The only thing you can do is to test it from personal experience. Test it from personal experience for what? For what you expect to get out of it. So one has to be very clear what exactly is it that you expect to get out of self-realization or enlightenment or whatever word you want to use. What is it that you want to get out of it? Mainly, I think, if you analyze it, two things, one or the other, and both relate to life as we know it. Enlightenment or self-realization is not something beyond this life. That's the first thing to understand. Beyond life, no one has been able to tell you what it is. No one is dead and can speak to you. What happens after death? In any case, why should anybody care what happens after death? Because the one who cares about life is no longer there to care about death. So I repeat, whatever the word means to you, whatever you expect out of it is in this life. So what do you want out of enlightenment or self-realization? <coughs> if you think of it, then it will mean that you have to find out exactly what do you mean by self-realization. What do you want out of it? Now it may be that there is a misconception about enlightenment or self-realization. It may be that someone's concept of enlightenment or self-realization is to have enormous powers. The powers which the Indian yogis have demonstrated over time in history. To be able to walk on water, to know the future, to be able to heal. Maybe you are seeking those powers. And those powers are not, in my concept of enlightenment, something you can dare to have. You may have these powers, and yet there may be nothing at all like enlightenment. So powers have nothing to do with enlightenment according to my concept. My concept based only on one very simple thing. Events happen, deeds are done, there is no individual doer thereof. So what does this bring? The valid question from the ego. That is another misconception. The ego has to be destroyed. Destroy your ego. So many masters independently have told the disciple the same thing. One who comes, I have, what have you come here? To have my ego destroyed. And independently, many masters have told me, all right, produce your ego and I'll just smash it before your eyes. Produce your ego. Where is the ego? 
the ego is the seeker. And the seeker, the ego, is not going to destroy itself. So the first thing I would like you to accept it from my, as a my concept, it is the ego who is the seeker. And such spiritual practices as may be necessary have to be done by the same ego who is the seeker. So, to try to get rid of the ego seeker defeats the purpose. In other words, what I'm saying is, my concept does not require you to fight the ego. On the contrary, make friends with it. So to the ego seeker who puts up an unconscious resistance to any teaching, the end of which is the end of the ego, the ego consciously or unconsciously puts up a resistance. Therefore, the valid question from the ego is, all right, supposing I come to the definite, total, deepest conviction that I am not the doer, in what way will it bring me peace? That is a valid question from the ego. I'm searching peace. So the question that is asked by the ego is, assuming that I do get this final understanding, in what way will it bring me peace? Assuming that it is peace, that is sought. So again, according to my concept, all that can be sought is, again to quote the Buddha, he said, samsara is dukkha. Life is mostly unhappiness. Nirvana is shanti. Nirvana means peace. The state of nirvana means peace. The state of being alive in life and living means a great deal of unhappiness. And he added, they are not two. In other words, my interpretation of the Buddha's teaching on this point is that Buddha makes it perfectly clear. You have got, you have no way but to live your life in circumstances in which you have been placed. You still have to continue to live your life in the circumstances in which you have been placed. And the shanti of nirvana, the peace of nirvana that you are seeking, is not a separate place you go to. It's not a cave in the Himalayan mountains to which you can retreat. So, what the Buddha said was, you have to find the peace of nirvana while living your life in samsara. So, the ego's question is very valid. How do I find that peace while continuing to suffer the misery of life? Crudely put, that's what it comes to. The misery of life cannot be avoided. So if any teaching promises you that life will have no more misery for you, once there is enlightenment, you can take it. 
that that is false. So the point is, the miseries of life have to be accepted. The miseries of life have to be accepted. And in the acceptance of those miseries arises the peace of nirvana. Now, how can this happen? That is the question which the ego asks. And I begin the teaching by beginning with the seeker. Who is the seeker? Not the body-mind organism. What is the human mind? What is the human being? Beginning with that, what is the human being? My answer to the question is that the human being as such, the human being as a human being is no more than one object, one species of object, which along with thousands and thousands of other species of objects constitute the totality of manifestation. So to go back to the beginning, all there is, according to my concept, the one source, the one without the second, which is what is meant by Advaita. Dvaita means two, and Advaita means not two. So Advaita simply means that all there is is consciousness. By whatever name you regard it, you can regard it as the source, you can regard it as consciousness, as the Hindu Upanishads say, the consciousness meaning the impersonal awareness of being. That is consciousness. The impersonal awareness of being, which is the only truth in phenomenality. I said everything is a concept. If everything is a concept, what is the truth? The truth in phenomenality in the manifestation and its functioning is only one. And that is the truth. That is the source. That is the potential energy which has activized itself into this manifestation. The impersonal awareness of being, I am, which no one can deny. The atheist may deny that God exists. But he cannot deny that he or she exists. And that existence is not as an individual entity. The awareness that I'm talking about is the same in every human being. I am the two words in the Bible. That is what the impersonal awareness is. I am. Not a Jane or Robert or Ramesh or Wayne or anyone. The impersonal awareness of existence. If it is difficult to understand this concept, and it is not easy, it is not easy because of only one thing, and that is one's my mind and memory. But if you can imagine, not a very pleasant prospect, but if you can imagine that at any moment your entire memory has been wiped out. No memory. You don't know who you are. You don't know who your family is, whether you have a family. But you are fully conscious. No memory of what you are. Then what will remain? What will remain, if there is no memory, is just this impersonal awareness of being. I am. 
and that is the only truth. And once anyone begins to think or talk about it, even this truth becomes a concept. But if you are able to be in that impersonal awareness, and it is possible. My concept is that every human being, whether he is a seeker or not, has this experience almost every day. That experience may last a few moments or it may last longer. When there is no thought, there is no thinking, there is no dipping into past memory, there is no thinking about future consequences. And those moments do happen in every human being. But what happens when those moments happen? If there is a spiritual seeker and there has been some progress in the spiritual seeking, then the seeker ego says those were beautiful moments. I was at peace and I want more of those moments. If the ego is not a seeker, I mean a spiritual seeker, then that ego which is not a spiritual seeker, when he comes into, this, into the picture, in those moments the whole point is there is no personal ego. That is why those moments occur. But when in that experience is over and the ego comes in, the spiritual seeker says, I want more of that. And the ego who is not a seeker tells himself, I've been wasting my time. I should have been doing something. Go on, do something. That is the difference. So for these moments to happen, you do not have to be a spiritual seeker. Because you don't cause those moments. Those moments happen as God's grace. So, basically, apart from the ego, what is the human being? Apart from the ego, the ego is identification with a particular body-mind organism and a name as a separate entity. And the really important point I'm making is that this identification with a particular body-mind organism and a particular name as a separate entity does not vanish from the sage. The only understanding is, according to my concept, I am not the doer, nor is anyone else the doer. That is the only understanding. But that understanding does not, cannot, remove identification with a particular body, mind, organism and a name as a separate entity. Therefore, it is not that the sage does not consider himself a separate entity. He does. In order to live his life for the rest of the allotted span, the sage has to live as a separate entity. That is another big misconception. The sage not only becomes a perfect human being, but the sage regards everybody else as himself. Visitors come to me, they have been through other things, and the words universal love appeals to them. It has a unique attraction, universal love. So he says, I've been, oh, I've been a seeker for 30 years. So I said, what is the understanding that we have come to now? And the understanding is, oh, it's very simple, Ramesh. What I have come to is the basis of peace, 
is universal love. Oh. <laughs> and what is universal love? Again, very simple. I must love you as I love myself. That's all. I must love everybody as I love myself. Very simple, you see. So I say, is that the understanding? I say, yes, that is the understanding. And I've been at it 30 years. And my master has confirmed it. So I said, would you or your master in your universal love embrace a leper if he comes before you? Universal love. Would you be able to embrace a leper if he comes before you? That universal love stops there. You see. So, what I'm saying is, even in the case of a sage, the identity as a separate entity according to my understanding of enlightenment or self-realization, has to continue for that sage to live for the rest of his life. Ramana Maharshi lived for 50 years after his self-realization. And he lived those 50 years as a separate entity. If someone called him by name, he responded. He responded with compassion, of course. He responded with compassion. His name is called. So he said, yes, what can I do for you? But the fact that Ramana Maharshi responded to his name being called, whatever the name, but he knew it, he, it was he who was meant. The fact that a sage responds to his name being called obviously means that there is identification with a particular body, mind, organism and a name as a separate entity. So, the ego asks the question, quite again a valid question. If the ordinary man responds to his name being called, and the sage responds to his name being called, both are identified with a particular body, mind, organism and a name as a separate entity. Where is the difference? The difference is very simple. The ordinary man considers himself as not only a separate entity, but a separate entity with a personal doership. I do my actions, you do your actions. And he does his actions. But the one thing which made Ramana Maharshi a sage is that there was total unequivocal acceptance that no one does anything. It is the same consciousness or the same source of the same energy, the same impersonal energy, which functions through every human body, mind, organism. In other words, the separation is only in the appearances of the objects. But the functioning element is the same, exactly like electricity functions through the thousands of electrical gadgets. The electrical gadgets are separate entities, separate objects. But it is electricity which functions through all of them. So it is the same consciousness or the same source or the same energy or the same God who functions through every human being. That is the basis 
of the understanding which, according to my concept, constitutes enlightenment or self-realization. Such an understanding does not necessarily bring about any specific, special powers in that body-mind organism in which the understanding has happened. The really important point, in case those powers happen, is that the sage does not consider himself to have those powers. And therefore, and as far as the sage is concerned, there is no question of his using those powers. So, if you find someone who has those powers and uses them, you can take it that there has not been self-realization or enlightenment. I'm not saying powers will not come. Powers may come. But the sage does not use them as an individual for his own purposes. One particular incident comes to my mind. With Ramana Maharshi, uh, an old lady came with her grandson, who was obviously dying. She carried him, sat down, placed the body before, beside her, saying nothing. And within five or ten minutes, the boy sat up and was perfectly all right. Everybody noticed it. And the woman couldn't help it. She came forward, bowed down, repeatedly thanked him for giving her grandson back to her. The Ramana Maharshi, because everybody else was, one thing that the Ramana Maharshi was concerned about the teaching is that there should be no misconception. So he made it perfectly clear that he had not brought about the cure. He made it brutally clear. He said there was no sankalpa means there was no desire or wish or thought to cure that child. In other words, he was brutally clear. It had happened and as far as he, as an individual body-mind organism and an entity is concerned, he had nothing to do with it. He made that abundantly clear. There was no sankalpa. I mean, there was no intention to cure that child. Compassion might have arisen. I'm not saying that he was insensitive or that compassion didn't arise. But he made it perfectly clear that Ramana Maharshi as an individual entity did not even mentally express a wish to cure that boy. So powers may be there powers may function. But the main point is the sage does not consider himself as the doer of those cures. So, basically, with that misunderstanding removed, the question arises from the ego. You see, the guru or the teacher has to deal with the ego and he accepts it. Therefore, the ego has a right to ask questions. So the first question that he asks is, in what way does the teaching help me to get peace? Assuming I do not have that total acceptance, 
but assuming I do have that, and then he says, if you convince me that I shall have the peace with this understanding, then I shall come to you and say, how do I get that understanding? But first, tell me in what way this understanding will bring me the peace, which is a valid. Therefore, I say, I do expect the ego to ask me if the teaching is concerned. Now, let me interrupt and tell you again, quite brutally, that I'm not concerned whether you get the understanding or not. I repeat, I truly am not concerned whether you get the understanding or not. Why? For the simple reason that you did not choose to be a seeker and I did not choose to be a teacher. <laughs> as simple as that. The seeking began in your case, the teaching began in this case. So if I am not the teacher, if I am not doing the teacher, why should I be concerned whether the teaching has any effect or not? But again, let me be clear, I am not saying that if I see that the teaching in, in several cases goes straight to the heart, various ways of seeing it, knowing it. It is not that a sense of pleasure doesn't arise. Of course, a sense of pleasure arises. A sense of even gratification arises. What is the gratification about? That one body-mind organism, one ego, through that body-mind organism, has received the deep impact of the teaching. So the sense of gratification is for, for the seeker to have received an impact of the teaching. But knowing that I am not the teacher, quite frankly, I am not even the, the speaker at this moment. Knowing that, the sense of gratification is not accompanied by a sense of achievement. The sense of pleasure or the sense of gratification, when I see the impact of the teaching, I, I, I do say that there is a sense of pleasure when the teaching is accepted. But there is no sense of any personal achievement. That is the important point. So, the point I'm making again, I repeat, is that whether the teaching reaches you or not, and the depth and intensity of that teaching is not in your control, and certainly not in mine. Whether it happens or not depends entirely on that power which started the seeking. whether the teaching takes any effect at all, and whether the teaching that has an impact is genuine or not, is entirely the will of God and the destiny of that particular body-mind organism. In other words, my basic concept in phenomenality, basic concept is that there is only one reality, call it by any name, impersonal energy, source, consciousness, noumenon, or God, as the ordinary man calls it. But the source is the only reality which has expressed itself into this manifestation which is the totality of objects and the functioning of that totality. And in that functioning of the totality, life as we know it 
the ego is a very necessary function. In other words, the human being without the ego is merely a uniquely programmed body-mind object, instrument, computer if you like. According to my concept, the human being without the ego is no more than a uniquely programmed instrument or computer. You had no choice in being born to particular parents. Therefore, you have had no choice about the genes or the unique DNA in that body-mind organism which you call yourself. For the same reason, you had no choice about being born to particular parents in a particular environment in which this body-mind object has been receiving continuous conditioning. Continuous conditioning. The ego has been told from day one what is supposed to be good for you, what is bad for you, what is sin, what is guilt. Therefore, the conditioning has always been for the ego that he or she is the doer. That is the conditioning of thousands of years. The conditioning the ego has been receiving that he is the doer, he is responsible for his actions and he is the one who has to achieve anything whether it is money or salvation, it is he himself who has to achieve it. That is the conditioning. And what self-realization means is the removal of that conditioning of thousands of years of the sense of personal doership. That is all it really comes to. You are not achieving anything. The only thing that self-realization means is the removal of that which constitutes the sense of personal doership, which is the ego with a sense of personal doership. So life means interhuman relationships. And interhuman, the basis of interhuman relationships is the ego. The various egos, see, this is a friend of mine that's an enemy. I hate him, I love her. So, basically, the human being in its as capacity as an object is a uniquely programmed computer in which a thought happens which according to Benjamin Libet, according to laboratory experiments, a thought happens half a second or some other laboratory example, 3.5, not 0.5, but 3.5 seconds before that human ego has considered its, its own thought. That has been proved in a laboratory. Therefore, the human being who considers it his thought has happened almost half a second before he accepted it as his thought. So obviously, no thought which the human being considers his or her thought can be his or her thought because it has happened half a, almost half a second before that. Therefore, another well-known writer called John Franklin, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning writer, he has put it beautifully. He says, the human being is a mechanism and in that human mechanism, there is a mechanism which prevents the human mechanism 
from seeing its mechanistic nature. <laughs> the human being is a human mechanism. But in that human mechanism, there is a mechanism which prevents that human mechanism from seeing its mechanistic nature, which is the sense of personal doership and the ego. So it is the ego which prevents the human mechanism from seeing its mechanistic nature. And the source has deliberately produced it, created it in every human being, so that interhuman relationships would happen, and life as we know it can happen. And because of the interhuman relationships, the reaction of the ego, there is happiness or unhappiness. And as the Buddha says, more unhappiness than happiness. So the ego's question remains. I cannot help reacting to what happens in the world. I'm happy or I'm unhappy. Causes me misery. So, how will this total acceptance, if it happens, that I'm not the doer, nor is anyone else the doer, how is it going to help me live my life more peacefully? And that is a valid question. So the answer is that if it is accepted that whatever happens is a reaction in a body-mind computer over which the ego truly has no control. That is the basic understanding. So, how does the source or the consciousness of God use the each human computer? with a unique programming which makes each object an individual object through which God can bring about any action that he wants through that object exactly at that moment and at that time. The answer is God sends you a thought. God sends a thought into a me mechanism. And it is laboratory experiments have proved that it is a thought not produced by the body-mind organism. And physics has proved that thought to be something beyond over which the human being has no control. The physicist has expressed it thus. The physicist says, at any moment, there are thousands of probabilities possible for any human body-mind organism. And out of those thousands of probabilities, one probability collapses as a thought in that particular body-mind organism. And this happens in thousands and thousands and millions of human computer. So the source of God puts in an input. The brain reacts to that input and produces an output. So far, according to my concept, there is no difference whether that particular body-mind organism is that of a sage or that of an ordinary person. Same thought could come into two body-mind organisms, one that of a sage and the other that of an ordinary man. The reaction would still be the same. A reaction of anger or amusement or compassion or fear. Fear could arise in a body-mind organism as an output 
same as that in the case of an ordinary person. Again, where does the difference lie then? If the brain reacts to an input and brings out an output of fear, in the case of a body-mind organism of a sage, as well as in the ordinary body-mind organism, where is the difference? The difference is in what happens after the biological or mechanical reaction happens. Then the ego comes and the ego reacts to the biological reaction. In the case of an ordinary person, the ego with a sense of personal doership reacts to the arising of fear, considers it as he is being a prey. I was a prey. I don't want to be afraid, but this happens every time. I wish I were a brave man like my friend. All this is horizontal involvement in time, in duration. The output happening in a body-mind organism is in the moment, instant. The reaction of the ego is in horizontal duration. In the case of a sage, the sense of doership not being there, the arising of the figure, fear and the attendant action, the sage runs away, the body-mind organism runs away, or whatever happens, is accepted by the sage as something which was supposed to happen through a particular body-mind organism. The sage accepts the biological or mechanical reaction, the ordinary man doesn't, and therefore becomes unhappy. So the acceptance of the natural or biological or mechanical reaction by the sage means less misery. There is no psychological misery in the case of a sage where it happens in the case of an ordinary man. The physical injury happens, the sage accepts it, not as something done by someone else, but the hurt was supposed to happen according to God's will and the destiny of that body-mind organism. The sage accepts the hurt as something that had to happen according to God's will and not something done to him by another person. The action that brought about the hurt through which a body-mind organism it happens, the sage is not really concerned. The sage is concerned only with the fact that according to the will of God and the destiny of that body-mind organism, the hurt was supposed to happen. So the acceptance of that hurt not as something done by someone means the sage does not hate anyone. The sage accepts that no one has the power to hurt him if it were not God's will. The hurt has happened because it is God's will. No one has the power to hurt me if it were not God's will. Therefore, it is stupid, downright stupid. The sage says, to hurt, to hate anyone. What's the point? He hasn't done it. He can't do it. He doesn't have the power to do it. So accepting that no one has the power to hurt him means that in the case of a sage, there is no hatred for anybody else. There is no hatred. By the same token, there is no jealousy or envy for anyone else. About actions happening through others, the sage sees them not at anyone's actions, but as a happening which was supposed to happen to that particular body-mind organism according to the will of God. So in the case of a sage, for any consequences of any actions happening through anyone else, there is no personal 
relationship in more. So there is no, the sage does not carry any load of hatred, jealousy, and envy for any action which happened through anyone in the world. As far as actions happening through his own body, mind, organisms are concerned, the sage knows that any action that has happened is not his own action. So, an action that happened through that body, mind, organism is accepted by society as a very good action. The society applauds the action happening through the body-mind organism of a sage. Again, the acceptance by the society of this action may produce a sense of pleasure. The acceptance of the society means an input in the body-mind organism of the sage. The brain reacts to that acclaim of society. The output is a sense of pleasure. But that sense of pleasure is not accompanied in the case of a sage by any pride. How can pride arise when he knows it is not his action which has been applauded by society? Sense of pleasure, but not pride. The other extreme, an action happens through the body-mind organs, which the sage knows is not his action. But it has hurt someone's feelings or some physically. The society condemns it. That action of that person was bad. So, rejection by the society of an action which has happened through that body-mind organism is accepted by the sage as God's will. And therefore, a sense of regret may arise. A sense of regret, but knowing that it was not his action, a sense of guilt cannot arise. Why should he feel guilty when he knows that it is not his action? So, what is the total result? As far as actions happening through his own body, mind, organism, the sage witnesses a sense of pleasure arising, but there is no load of pride. The sage witnesses a sense of regret arising, but no load of guilt. The sage accept, witnesses and accepts the hurt happening to himself, but knowing that it was not anyone's action which has produced the hurt, but the destiny of that body-mind organism, the hurt will be accepted without any hatred towards anybody. So what is the net result of this total acceptance that no one is a doer, neither he himself nor anyone else? The pleasure or the pain or the hurt happens and is accepted as the will of God and the destiny of that body-mind organism. But that acceptance will not be accompanied by a load of pride or guilt or hatred or jealousy. So the sage continues to live in samsara, participates in samsara or life as we know it, accepts the pleasures and the pains that are his lot according to God's will, that are his destiny, like anyone else. So, the sage participates in samsara or life, accepts his share of the pains and pleasures, but without the enormous load of pride and arrogance, guilt or shame, or hatred or jealousy or envy. So my answer to the ego is, I am not promising you that life will not mean misery. Life may mean misery and happiness to the extent that it is your destiny. But those miseries and pleasures 
will not be accompanied, you will not be carrying the enormous load of pride and arrogance, guilt and shame, or hatred and jealousy. That is the advantage of this acceptance that no one is a doer. In other words, what I am telling the ego is, you will not only not die, but you will continue to live as long as the body-mind organism lives, but without the enormous load of pride and guilt and hatred. So, if that is acceptable, you may try. I still tell the ego, he has to do the trying. If you accept that what you are going to get is worth your effort, that the absence of this load is worth making an effort, then the ego says, all right, I'm convinced. Now tell me, how do I get that understanding that I'm not the doer? It, I'm still dealing with the ego. So I tell the ego, very simple, I'm not asking you, but remember this is my concept, I keep telling the ego too. Because the ego, otherwise the ego will bombard me every three minutes. How do I know it's the truth? So I keep telling the ego it's a concept. But a concept that could bring you an enormous amount of peace. So the ego says, what do I have to do? So I tell the ego, according to my concept, you don't have to meditate for 10 hours. Because if you meditate for 10 hours, then the danger is that you will consider yourself a more successful practitioner of seeking than someone else who is not able to practice, to meditate for 10 hours. Therefore, as your ability to meditate goes from 2 hours to 10 hours, your pride will also correspondingly increase. <laughs> and the biggest obstacle to the happening of self-realization is pride and guilt. So, I'm not asking you to meditate for 10 hours a day. I'm not even going to ask you to meditate for one hour because I'm telling the ego, you are entitled to ask me. Ramesh, you are asking me to meditate, all right, not 10 hours, but two hours, all right, one hour. But if I'm not able to meditate for one hour, what do I do? <laughs> Valid argument. Therefore, I'm not asking the ego to either meditate or starve himself. I'm not asking him to go and do a lot of social work in the village. Because then what will happen is, all those villagers will treat you like God. And you will feel that you are God. That is the danger. Then the ego Im impatiently says, all right, all right, what do you want me to do? So I said, all I want you to do is to find out from your own experience whether you have been the doer. What is your own experience? Forget my telling you, that's a concept. What is your own experience so far? Think of any action that you thought you did. If your friend asks you about it, how did you manage to do that tremendous achievement, almost certainly you will begin to recollect that incident or that achievement. Almost certainly you will begin your statement by saying, at such and such a time, at such and such a place, it so happened. So, if your action, which you are so proud of, happened, because something else happened over which you had no control, how can you call it your action? So from previous experience, investigate it 
investigate any action that has happened in your experience and you will come to the conclusion that what you thought was your action depended on something else happening over which you have no control. Therefore, how can you call it your action? But that is past experience. More important, find out now from actions happening now, today. So if you are busy during the day, all I tell the ego is, try and find 10, 20 minutes at the end of the day. Sit back quietly. Investigate, analyze, investigate thoroughly and honestly. Even one action during the day which you are convinced is your action. Find out how did it happen? Did I decide to do it? Or was it that a thought came over which you had no control? Or you saw something over which you had no control? Or you heard something over which you had no control? Which led to that action? And every time, I would guarantee that every ego that the ego will come to the conclusion that whatever he thought was his action turns out to be not his action because he had no control over it. So day after day, action after action, if you come to the conclusion, I'm telling the ego, that an action which you thought was your action turns out to be on investigation that it is not your action, then, at some point, you will ask yourself, if I am not the doer, if there is truly no me concerned in life that is happening through this body-mind organism, obviously the same thing must happen through others. In other words, the ego comes to the conclusion that life happens. No one lives his life. If life happens through every body-mind organism, is a me necessary? Is a me really necessary? And that question will be pure misery. That question to which the ego himself has arrived will not let him be. Every free moment the question will arise, who is this me? Is this me necessary? And that is what I call the dark night of the soul. I had a Buddhist monk visit me some few months ago. He has been a Buddhist monk for over 20 years. And we had a good talk for three, ta three days. And at one of these points when I mentioned this, I call it the dark night of the soul. He suddenly sat up and he says, in the Buddhist teaching also, in such circumstances, there is a specific word. He mentioned it, I forget the word. But he translated it. He was an Australian monk, so we are talking in English. And he said, the exact translation of the Buddhist word is horrors. You say, dark night of the soul, and the Buddhist word is horrors. So the ego, when it reaches that stage, is there any me at all, suffers horrors. And depending on God's will and the destiny of that particular body-mind organism, if it is the will of God, then the answer comes from the source, not intellectually. Intellectually, the answer was there. There is no me. Therefore, this question, if there is no me doing anything, is there a me? So that question was not intellectual. That question was also from the source. And the answer, again, if it is the will of God, happens. And the answer from the source comes. My dear child, there never has been any me. All these me's are suffering unnecessarily. And that is because that is their destiny. You see? So, all that the ego has to do according to my concept 
is to make a thorough and honest investigation about any action that he thought his action. Was it truly his action or did it depend upon happenings over which he had no control? And then he will come to the conclusion every time that no action which he thought was his or her action was truly his or her action. And that is the only spiritual practice I recommend. And the advantage is this. Any other spiritual practice, I'm not pleased. I'm not condemning other practices. I'm not condemning other spiritual practices. Every spiritual practice, if well done, will have its results. But what I'm saying is, in other spiritual practices, meditation or repeating God's name, social service, whatever other spiritual practice, the danger is, I repeat, I'm not condemning any spiritual practice, but the danger is that as you progress in your effort, I'm telling the ego, the danger is that as you proceed and get your progress, your strength also will increase. Your pride will increase. That is the danger. What happens in this practice? More actions you investigate, the more deeply you understand that there is no me. So in this practice, the advantage is that the ego gets weaker along with the progress. The danger in the other practices is, while there is progress, the ego could be stronger. Well, that's enough, I think. <laughs> 75 minutes of stupid talk. Totally unnecessary. <laughs> totally unnecessary. So, if you have any questions, please ask. But in any case, send me your written questions. Please. I have been told, Krishnamurti said, freedom is the lack of choice. Yes. Freedom is the says, lack of choice. I've been told he, he said. Yes. Would you please comment I'm, on I, that? I, will you please repeat the question? I haven't got it. I'm a little dull in mind. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told yes. Krishnamurti yes. said freedom is the lack of choice. Freedom is the lack of choice. Would you please comment on that? Yes. Because I always thought it's freedom to have a choice. <laughs> you see, this freedom is from wanting a choice. The freedom is from wanting a choice. Everything happens, you, it's accepted. Then you don't need a choice. So the freedom is from wanting a choice. You see? That is the freedom from wanting a choice. I am the doer. I am competing with God. I want something, I get it or not. I think it depends on my effort. But if God intervenes, I have to fight him all the time. So the freedom is freedom from wanting a choice. Wanting to do something. That's my interpretation of most welcome. Mr. Ramish. Please um, sit in that chair. Oh, yeah, thank you very yeah. much. Let her sit. See, let her stand. She's been sitting all this time. <laughs> My uh, specific question is... Yes. You, you explain... Could you speak a little louder, please? Yeah, you Not for them, but for me. Okay. 
You explain. Um, yes, that's better, much better. Find out your own destiny via your experience. No. Via your. But you via said, all those. No, no. You you thought I said find out your own destiny. No. But how? No. What you just said how is. How can I read the meaning of the of the of uh, of the of what happens every day of the of my experience, which I do every day, how shall I read the meaning of it? When you, oh, you mean tell us uh, in the evening you should sit down, sit down for uh, 10 yes. or 20 minutes. Yes. So I think about uh, the entire day, what was happened to me and no. so what action I'm not on. asking you to review your entire day. All I'm saying is, during the day, Think of any action which you are convinced is your action. That is all I am saying. Think of one action which you are convinced is your action, for which you are responsible. Think of one action. Then when you deal with that one action, you may go to the other. But that one action which you are convinced is your action, what I am saying is, deal with it this way. How did it begin? Let us say, you went to a restaurant for lunch. You have come to Sherma. You went to a particular restaurant for lunch. I selected the restaurant. I went to that restaurant. I had what I had to eat. My action. You see, simple thing like that, investigate it. What made you go to that restaurant? One, you didn't know about the restaurant. You heard someone talking, and they said it's a good restaurant, not too expensive. So hearing that was the cause of your action. Was that your action, which was started by some hearing something? Or two, you went to that restaurant, because last year also you had been there and it was a good. So, what led to your action? The memory of something which happened previously. You didn't decide to go to that restaurant. So what I'm but saying... But I'm responsible for this memory, which I thought. My previous action... Yes or previous decisions, yeah. or whatever, yeah. are responsible for, so, for this memory in my mind, so, or not? So it was your memory? And whose memory? Memory, re memory? memory is confined to that body. Whose memory? But even that memory was responsible. If that memory was not responsible, you didn't decide. So that memory made you go to that restaurant. You see, you'll, you will come to the conclusion so thoroughly, you will laugh. Because nothing, you don't decide to do anything. Always something leads to it. That's why I said, think of any experience previously which you thought you were action, particularly something which you thought you did very well, you achieved something. And if you are going to tell someone, a friend, how it happened, what you did at what time, almost certainly, my friend, you'll begin. It so happened that at that time, at that place, I was doing this. Then something happened, which led to the action which you consider your achievement. And uh, how to find out after this evening in your example, whether it was a right decision... Oh, I'm not concerned with the right decision. Oh, no. I'm not concerned with the right decision. I'm only concerned with your finding out whether it was your action. Whether you decided to do that action at that time and place, or did something lead to that action. If something else led to that action, then it was not your action. Your action depended on something else happening, over which you had no control. In other words, an action happens. There is no individual doing it. That is the Buddha's word. Events happen, deeds are done. 
but there is no individual doer thereof. And that, the Buddha's uh, concept, is to be tested by each ego from his own personal experience. And each ego has come to, come to the conclusion, same conclusion which Buddha came to, that there is no individual doer. I mean, there are various other points, you see. Responsibility. What about responsibility? All that you give me in writing, and <laughs> we'll deal with it tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Marguerite? No, no, no bhajans to it? Oh, there are. So, shall we stop for tonight and... Uh, Oh, there is. Please. Please. Can I... Okay. Yes, sure. Um, Certainly. Uh, you suggested at the end of the day to sit down and look if any of the uh, acts... Yes. What, ...what happened during the day yes. were the acts that I choose. Yes. Right? For example, now I ask the microphone, right? So I choose to yes. speak in the microphone. Yes. Do you suggest to... Uh, to be, uh, pay How? attention. No, wait a minute. Yes. Your question is, you think it is your action? Uh, uh, y yes, yes, obviously. You're yeah. asking the question. Yes, yes. This is my action. Yes, exactly. And yeah. what I'm saying is, what led to that action? My asking questions. If I hadn't asked questions, you wouldn't have asked the question. Sure. Therefore, it was not your ac action that you asked the question. So what I'm saying is, Something leads to something which you think is your action. Yeah, I, I, I would like to arrive to a, to a point. Yes. The point is, do you also suggest to, let's say in a, in a paradox, to try to make a choice? Can it lead at the same, in the same direction? In, in the sense, instead of at the end of a day, while I'm doing yes. a, a, an action, yes. really be careful while I'm doing it. Yes. If it's me doing it, yes. or how it's, how it's working, or do you suggest to do it afterwards? No. You see, that is totally another point, like responsibility. We'll deal with it tomorrow. Okay. I mean, your question, I said one is responsibility. Yes. The other is making a choice. That is what you are concerned with. Yes. Making a choice. Yes. We'll I deal with those tomorrow. Okay. Okay. I mean, you'll think of other things. I said responsibility, making a choice, consequences. If I am not responsible for what I did, why should I be punished? My, my, my concern is not an understand, intellectual, intellectual understanding. Quite I'm right. not at all concerned about it. I understand. My, my concern it, is to find a way, because I see sincerely, but my spiritual seeking is just seeking control. I'm sincerely, that's what I'm... I'm say that again. You're seeking... What, uh, yes. arriving here today, yes. I am more... Com more uh, I realize that my spiritual seeking yes. actually yes. is seeking control. It, I would like to have control of my life. Yes. I, I, it doesn't fit in what I think, but that's the reality. Yes. Okay. Yes. So what I'm trying is... I understand what you say, and I'm trying to disrupt this illusion that I am doing the choice yes. and I am deciding and I am the doer. Yes. So I'm just uh, looking for a way. Yes. So my question was if before doing an action, yes. if I can stop and think, is this my action? That was my question, but uh, maybe... Yes. But even that, why are you asking whether it is your question, whether it is your action? You're asking that because you are only concerned with the consequences. You are really concerned. Absolutely, yes. What are you concerned with? Is that a right action or not? Is that a right choice or not? That is what you are concerned with, not whether it is your action. What are you really concerned with, my friend? Whether the choice that you have made is right or wrong. And before you have done it, you would like to think again. So your question is really about Choice. Yes, it's possible. I'm listening. Yes, it's yes. possible. We'll, we'll deal with that tomorrow if you don't mind.